everyone. We are so thrilled to have you join us today to kick off our Parent Empowerment Speaker Series. We'll have a different expert speaker featured each Tuesday for the entire month of April at 12 p.m. And the link that you signed up with today will remain the same the entire month. So this is the first webinar of our Parent Empowerment Speaker Series, and it's hosted by End Exploitation Montana. My name is Chelsea Winterholler, and I am the Director of Operations at End Exploitation Montana. And I will be your host for the next four weeks of this webinar series. I just want to go through a few logistics. This is a webinar, so you will only be able to see and hear me and our guest speaker. You are all muted, no one can see you, but the Q&A feature is open for your questions and for your comments. And at the end of the presentation, we will have times for, time for questions, and I will pull those from the Q&A. You can also select yourself to be anonymous when you are submitting those questions. I do want to remind you at this time that this presentation is intended for adults. Feel free to share our posts that are on social media. And this video will also be posted on our website at mediasafety.org after the event. You will also receive a follow-up email with a direct link to this video. We are immensely grateful to our sponsors for this event. We could not do this work without our amazing community and all the support that we've received. We want to specifically thank our champion sponsors, uh, Billings Public Schools, St. Vincent Healthcare, Brewer Dental Center, and Rimrock Pediatric Dentistry. I just want to tell you a little bit how this speaker series came about. We at End Exploitation Montana could see the need for this information in our community. The most critical issues at the forefront for our youth right now are what we chose for each of the topics. Research shows that parents are the most important protective factor in the safety of their children, and we want to strengthen and empower each of you here today. Our goal in this webinar series is to empower parents in making a positive difference in our youth. So let's get on with it. Today, our speaker is going to be Amy Rest. Amy is a licensed clinical professional counselor and licensed marriage and family therapist who has worked for over 20 years with clients in multiple different settings. She has spent a large part of her career with children and teenagers and their families addressing emotional and behavioral concerns, working toward increasing connections in their relationships, and overall improving their emotional well-being. In addition to her professional work, Amy is also a mother of three children. They are ages 18, 15, and 10. She will be talking to us today about loving the teen years. So thank you so much for joining us, Amy. We are so excited to have you. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. And after you're done, we will go to our Q&A. Perfect, thank you so much. So I am gonna start out by asking you to just um, consider for a moment what comes to your mind when you think about teenagers. Um, maybe this depends, I'm guessing this depends on what stage you are at as far as parenting teenagers right now. Maybe you do not have teenagers yet, so you see teenagers in a very different way than someone who's just starting out in those years, and maybe even kind of enjoying them a little bit. And it's also probably a lot different than those who are really in the, the deep, dark parts of the teenage years where it can become really difficult, and there can be a lot of struggles. So just consider what comes to your mind when I, when I talk about teenagers. My hope today is that the way that you think about teenagers becomes more positive, even when we talk about the hard times with them. I want to give hope to parents and caregivers uh, who might be having a difficult time with their teenagers right now and share some ideas of what could help create better connections with your teenagers. And I also really want to be the voice of the teenagers because I work with a lot of teenagers. Um, I've heard a lot over the years of, of what it is that they feel they need or don't need when it comes to connection. And so I want to be able to maybe share their voices with you a little bit also. I'm gonna click over to share my screen a minute. 
with you. Okay. So while I've worked with um, teenagers and families and their families for over 20 years um, and currently have teenagers of my own, I would say that I am far from an expert um, on some of this. So I am relying not just on my experiences as a therapist and a parent, and not just on the experts um, from the books that I'm going to be referring to, but I, I did turn to the true experts who are the teenagers themselves. I talked to some of my teenage clients and I even asked my own teenagers what it is that they feel they need and want when it comes to connection, what's helpful and what isn't. Um, probably one of my first pieces of advice to you would be go home after this and talk to your own teenagers. When I asked my two teens um, what, they, what they felt would be helpful or what would be important to share, I was truly amazed at their insight and, and how open they were with me about what's helpful and what's not helpful. So if you go home and ask your own teenagers, you might be surprised at what they have to share with you. Some of, of what I heard, quite honestly, I wish I had known before I had teenagers, uh, but it was still helpful nonetheless. So first of all, what is connection? When we talk about connecting with our teenagers, what is it and why is it important? Um, attachment research really says that having a secure attachment with children, um, a good healthy connection with them helps them feel safe when they have difficult emotions, when they feel frightened or uncomfortable. It helps them feel secure enough to be able to go out and explore the world. And it helps them be able to accept and manage the emotional experiences that they're having in their lives. Children with a secure attachment typically have increased self-confidence. They have better uh, and more em empathy and compassion, which will help them in their future relationships. And they tend to be more resilient and have better endurance during difficult times. So what does this look like? What does a, a good, healthy, secure connection or attachment look like? I want you to picture this first with a young child, um, maybe 18 months. And so if you have a young child who walks into a, a new situation, a new room, kind of a strange room with a caregiver, I'm just gonna say a mom in this example, walks into this room with a mom and there is some fun looking toys over on the other side of the room. A child with a secure attachment will probably start out close to the mom, next to the mom, kind of feeling safe, checking out the surroundings. And then we'll, once he gets comfortable, we'll probably get off of her lap and wander over to the other side of the room and start to check out what's over there. Again, a securely attached child probably every now and again will turn and look and see, are you still looking at me? Are you still here? Maybe even occasionally coming over for a quick hug to feel reassured. Um, a securely attached teenager looks a lot the same. The only difference is that instead of it being this new room, it's the world. It's, it's this whole world that's open to them. Instead of it being just some fun toys on the other side of the room, it's going to be phones and video games and peers and whatever else might be really fun and exciting out there. So the important elements of secure attachment in these two scenarios honestly are kind of the same. It matters what that parent did before they were in that strange room in that situation that, that helped there be a secure attachment and help that child feel like he could be safe enough to get down and go explore and then could return for comfort at the same time. And then also what that parent did during that situation, during the new experience. So for those of you who do not have teenagers yet, uh, you're kind of in luck because you are at the stage where you're actually building the foundation for your relationship with your teenagers. You're at the perfect time to be doing the things that help them the most, that help them be able to feel that they can count on you, to feel that it's okay for them to go out and explore that world. Um, so, so we're gonna look at the mom in that scenario with the young child. She created a connection with that child through prior to that room, through time after time after time, consistently being present. 
by attuning to him and responding to his needs. So attuning is something that starts at a very, very young age where you notice when they seem distressed, you go to them to comfort them. You notice facial expressions and voice tones and body language and respond to them. Attuning to them helps you be able to respond to their needs in the way that you need. This mom probably in, in situations prior to this also would have allowed him to explore without hovering or coddling or forcing or pushing, but helping him do it in a way that felt safe to him. And then she was always present when he returned. If he needed comfort of some sort or reassurance of some sort, she was always there. So when he enters a new situation, he feels safe with all of those same things still happening. And the exact same thing is true for teenagers. Gretchen uh, Smelcher, I'll probably say her name wrong, uh, she talks about something called the sacredness of constancy. And this is the idea that doing this, the small things with your child over and over and over again um, help build this feeling of safety and connection with our children. So it's little things like the car rides to practices, the family dinners, the board games. These are the moments that don't always seem to matter, but they, they all do. Uh, they're the building blocks to the connection that we have with our children. Showing up for their games, taking first day of school pictures, snuggling and reading books together. They can seem really small, but they are, they are far from insignificant. Uh, Neufeld and, and Mate, they have a book called um, Hold On to Your hold on to your kids. And they talk about the idea of collecting our children. And this seems really easy when our kids are small, when we can, we can grab them and snuggle them and hold on to them. Um, the way that we sometimes coo, coo towards little infants and make eye contact with them. Collecting our children as, we get, as they get older becomes a little bit more difficult. Sometimes they don't want us to come and give them a big hug. Um, sometimes they don't want to sit and snuggle. Probably they don't want to sit and snuggle with you anymore. So collecting them starts to look just a little bit different. Uh, it may be something like squeezing their shoulder as you walk by them, or it can be catching their eye when they walk into the room because they know that they're seen. It's so important to help children's, children feel that they matter and that they're important and your priority. They need to feel that they belong. So a teenager doesn't necessarily sit and think about these things and that it feels really good to them as you do them, but they, they truly are the glue that holds the relationship together when it starts to feel like it might be falling apart or when it feels like they're pulling away. A teenager who has experienced these things as a child and then continues to experience them even now during the teenage years will feel safe and secure in the fact that you love them no matter what because each and every one of the small things that you do. Another important piece of this is the boundaries and the limits that you do put in place. If you think about this mom with a young child in the room, she doesn't just let that child go do whatever it wants over there. If there's a toy over there that is unsafe or not age appropriate, she would step in immediately to, to take that child um, away from the situation or to remove that item from the room so the child can be safe. And she doesn't do this by snatching it away or getting angry that the child wants to play with it. She does it in a gentle way that's, that's teaching. And again, this is true for our teenagers. Sometimes they need to have limits with things that are not age appropriate or that are not um, healthy or safe for them in some way. And that is our job to come in and set those boundaries and limits. And then what's important, you think about an 18 year old who has a toy that has to be removed from them, they're typically not calm, they're gonna be upset. Same with a teenager, right? We don't avoid setting those limits because of that. What we do is we acknowledge and allow and accept the upset feelings that they have. We provide comfort if they need it. This is true both of that small child, that young child and of a teenager. So another way to look at this, um, just to kind of give you a, a perspective on it, um, in the book, Raising a Secure Child, Hoffman, Cooper, and Powell talk about the idea of a secure base and a safe haven. And uh, Dan Siegel in his book, Brainstorm, which is about the teenager, about teenagers and their brains, 
um, uses the same idea, but he calls it a launching pad in a safe harbor. So the idea is to be this place for your children, whether they're young building that connection or as a teenager, to be this place that helps them set out from a safe place, a secure base. You launch them out into the world and then you are that safe harbor for them to come back to if they need to. Our teenagers need connection, and as they pull away, it is our job not to reel them in necessarily, but to give them the space to leave while still providing that constant reassurance that will always be there for them, no matter what. So I'm going to talk about how to do some of this for our teenagers, um, both when it's easy and when things happen along the way that become really difficult and make it more difficult. Um, some of what I talk about may seem pretty basic, and honestly, I, I hope some of it does, because if you're already doing those things, that's really good, and I want to reinforce that some of what you're doing may already be building a really good connection with your, with your child. Um, some of this is, is going to be talking about when it becomes more difficult, and that may not apply to everyone. Not everyone is in that stage right, right now with their teenagers when it gets really hard, but I definitely want to be able to touch on that a little bit later too. So one of the things that, that one of my sons had, had said to me when I was talking with him about this is he said, teenagers might need connection, but they don't always know that they do, and they don't always even feel sometimes like they want it. And so, and he said this very clearly, that makes it the parent's job to seek them out because they're not necessarily going to be the ones seeking their parents out most of the time. We'll come back to that, but most of the time they're not the ones seeking their parents. So the parent needs to make sure that they're the ones seeking out their teenagers. So a few, a few ideas of how to do this, know what your child is interested in, do what they are interested in. But don't just do it, have a genuine interest in them. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to love the activity. If they want you to sit and watch them play a video game, you do not have to love the video game or love sitting there watching them play a video game. What you end up enjoying or having a genuine interest in is your child as they're doing something that they enjoy. Children love to be delighted in. And honestly, even teenagers love that you love to be around them. It's really important to have planned times together, like vacations or spontaneous times together. Like you say, hey, let's hop in the car and go over to Dairy Queen. It's so important to show up for their activities as often as you can. And I understand that sometimes that's not always possible. I think about sometimes single parents and they're working and they can't make it to every activity. But if you show up as often as you can, that makes a difference to, to teenagers. Watch them like nothing else in the entire world matters to you. Trust me, teenagers notice this. I have had many teenagers over the years uh, who have told me that their parents didn't even rarely look up from their phone as they sat at their game um, or didn't seem interested in the performance that they were watching. Look at them when they talk to you. Make sure that you put down your own phone or you set down the bills or you turn down the music in the car. Truly, even teenagers wanna feel that nothing, more nothing is more important to you than they are and that they matter to you. And if you don't show them how much they matter to you, they will seek this out from someone else. Now, sometimes teenagers actually do seek connection. And it typically is in ways that are either very subtle or very inconvenient. So you need to make sure that you are always available and always approachable. I, what came to my mind as I was thinking of this is that old song, I think it was called The Cats in the Cradle. And it's about this kid who's saying, hey dad, come out and play with me, come out and play with me. And dad says, later son, later son, I'm really busy. And then later when the dad's ready, the child's grown up and doesn't need it or want it anymore. So make sure that you don't let it be too late. So how might this happen? Um, I, I know with my teenagers, it tends to be late at night when I'm really tired and they will come into my room and that's when they wanna talk. The room is dark. They don't have to maybe sometimes be seen. They can say what it is they wanna say. It feels safer to them in some way. And so as we're prying our eyes open to try to stay awake, it's so important that you take that time to do that. 
Um, sometimes, you know, we talk all the time about how teenagers isolate and they spend time in their rooms. I want you to honestly watch for the moments when they don't. Watch for when they maybe just come out and sit in the main room. They might still be on their phones and you think that they are, are completely disconnected. What that actually is, is a message of saying, I want to be in your space. I don't need to have a conversation, but I want to be in your space. Watch for that. You don't need to sit and talk to them if they're not wanting to talk, but a comment here or there letting them know you see them really matters. It honestly might be something where they say, hey, I really need a new pair of jeans. Can we go to the mall and get some? And you're really annoyed because you think how many pairs of jeans do you need? It might not actually just be about the jeans. It might be because they want to spend that time with you. Make sure you're listening for those small moments. Another really important thing is to accept your kids for who they, who they are and not who you want them to be. Because again, if you don't, they will find someone who will. I'm not a real fan usually of talking about don'ts. I think that tends to be pretty negative, but these came up over and over and over as I was talking to the teenagers. And so I wanna go over a couple of these. Uh, first of all, let's talk about peers. Peers can, can be a major roadblock to connecting with your teen. We know that teens start to become more peer oriented. Um, it can sometimes almost feel like they're rejecting us when they start to choose time with, with friends over time with us. But the thing is, is that it's completely natural and it's really important that we accept that. If we try to resist that too much, they're gonna want it even more. But we don't need to just step away from them and just let them go out and do that. We still need to make sure that we're being that safe harbor for them to come home to. As the teen begins to explore the world, this world out there with their peers, just like that toddler explored the room, we still need to be available. So chasing after our kids to make them talk to us doesn't work well. They do not want to be forced to have conversations about their feelings. And trust me, I know this as a therapist, I've tried many times to make my kids talk to me about their feelings and they're not fond of that. Um, but kids can and do sometimes come and, and share at times when we're not expecting it. So like I said earlier, make sure you're watching for those moments when it may be late at night or in a car ride home where just a little comment is made. Listen for that. Our job is is not to pry for the information, but to be ready and mostly just to listen. A comment that I've heard repeatedly from, from teenagers over the years is that their parents don't listen to them. And when we do family therapy with their parents, I can say that they're probably right. There's a lot of not listening that happens. Oftentimes I think parents think their job is to guide and teach and correct. And sometimes that is true. But oftentimes it just turns into lecturing instead of listening. And um, that will shut a teenager down so fast and it will lead to so much disconnect with them. Um, I think that parents are sometimes unfortunately experts at invalidating and judging and even shaming without realizing it sometimes. Now I don't I don't oftentimes hear teenagers say that their friends are really amazing and good listeners. Their friends are fun and they speak a common language, but honestly, their friends are wrapped up in their own issues. And so when a teenager really needs someone to listen, you need to make sure that you've created an environment and a relationship where they know that you're someone who will listen. The listening is key. Teenagers feel enough judgment in their lives, make sure that you're not one of the ones who's judging them. Uh, allowing time with their friends is fine. I think it, it's important and it matters. Just make sure that you're also making family time happen. Even though your teenagers might moan and groan about it and, and um, not always be fond of it, things like family dinners and holidays and vacations are imp important opportunities to show your teenagers. Um, how much you actually enjoy being with them. A child who feels known and understood by you will be so much less likely to seek that out and, and to replace us with their peers. Newfeld and Mate again in their book, Hold On To Your Kids, they say, we want children to be fulfilled with what they truly need before they have access to that which would spoil their appetite for what they truly need. 
In other words, we don't put a plate of cookies on the dinner table and let them fill up on the cookies before we give them the good dinner food, the healthy stuff. That's for later. It's for after they've been filled up with the good stuff first. And the same is true of peer relationships. You need to make sure your child is filled up with good, healthy connection with you before you allow that peer time. That way they're not replacing or making up for a void with this time with their friends. So sometimes this can be a little bit hard when our teenagers start to um, break the rules that we have for them or violate what some of our core values are. So Neufeld and Matei say this, they say we need to focus on the value of attachment. That is the most important value more than we focus on the breaking of the other values. We need to convey to them that our relationship, that the relationship we have with them matters more than what they've done. We have a tendency to focus on behaviors a lot more than we do on the relationship or even on what's underneath the behaviors. Um, this doesn't mean that we don't still discipline our children. Please don't get me wrong. We still need to do that. It's just that the primary objective is not just to correct our children, but to connect with them. And children who feel connected honestly tend to want to have the same values and follow those as you. If you're missing pieces of a connection with them, they're less likely to care. Also, I think this is something that parents do a lot. We tend to make conversations be about us, about what we went through and what we had to go through and how we had it this way, or we didn't have phones or whatever. And the truth is, is that most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, they don't need our stories. They don't need to hear what we went through or what was different when we were growing up. They need us to hear their stories. That's what's far more important. So Neufeld and Matei say this, and I think this is so important. I, I truly wanna stress this part. Something that we as parents have to offer that, that their peers cannot is unconditional love and acceptance. That's something that no peer is ever going to give, but we as parents can give that. And if our children know that, we have protected them in many, many ways from, um, from turning to peer relationships instead of us. And when they need that unconditional love and acceptance is honestly when it's probably the most difficult to give it. That's when they need it the most. So never is that more difficult than during the teen years. Teenagers are so full of emotions and they don't always come out in the best ways, especially when they're testing their independence. Yet it's when our teenagers test us and they push against us and they hurt us and they reject us that they need our unconditional love the most. When we feel tempted to shut down or to pull away or to lash out because we're so hurt by what they do, that's when it's imperative that we manage our own emotional reactions uh, so that what they are met with first and foremost from us is our unconditional love for them. I always say it in the way of lead with love, lead with love. You may have all these other emotions, but we need to be leading with love when we parent our children. They need to know that nothing they do will be able to separate them from our love. Nothing, not their anger, not our anger, nothing will separate them from our love. I used to tell my kids when they were little, you know, we don't have to withhold our love just because we're angry. We can feel angry at each other and love each other at the same time. And that felt a whole lot easier to do when they were little. And, and I will be the first to admit that I haven't always done that well. Um, but it's something that we need to strive for over and over and over again. And what's really important is, is if we do mess that up, the damage doesn't have to be permanent if we go back and repair. Acknowledging that sometimes our own hurt or our own anger got in the way and that we want to try it again is incredibly important to teenagers. We need to be able to acknowledge our mistakes and forgive theirs. In their book, um, Raising a Secure Child, Hoffman, Cooper, and Powell talk about the idea of rupture and repair. We, we are going to have ruptures in our relationship with our teenagers. That doesn't have to be permanently damaging if we're willing to go back and repair. And repair looks like acknowledging our mistakes. It looks like forgiving them for theirs. It looks like leading with love. That's the repair. So temporary breaks in the relationship are inevitable, but they're not harmful unless they are frequent and severe. 
the real harm that gets inflicted by these kinds of, of conflict that happens in relationships with our teenagers is when we neglect to recollect our child. Um, and, and the way that we collect them again after this is through that repair after a rupture occurs. We want to make so, and I, I really want to stress this, if we pull away, if we withdraw because we're hurting, the way that a teenager experiences that is as rejection. And if any of us have experienced rejection in our lives, we know how incredibly painful that is. And so if, if you can imagine that's the last thing you want is for your child to feel rejected by you, because what will they do? They will go turn to something else. They will turn to something that makes them feel better, whether that's peers or pornography or something else that helps them feel better. So it's so important to go back and repair any ruptures that happen. There's a children's book that I really love that's called No Matter What. And let something like that be your mantra. Show them and tell them that you love them no matter what. Teenagers are trying to find themselves, who they are and how they want to be. They need to be able to go out and explore that room. Teaching values early on is such an important way of allowing a child to do this. It's just important that we respect that they're not just an extension of us. They are their own person with a unique personality and their own goals and interests and desires. So one of my favorite words, any of my clients would tell you this, it's to be curious. I just want you to be so curious about this with them. Don't ever assume that you know them. So many teenagers, I've heard so many teenagers express frustration that their parents say they know them when really they don't. Likely we did when they were little, um, but they are changing in so many ways that sometimes they don't even know who they are. And so we don't honestly either. We need to be able to allow them to go through these changes, to stop making assumptions about them, to let them teach us, not just about themselves, but about the world they're living in. Now, curiosity is not being inquisitive. It's not prying and trying to find out all the answers. Truly, curiosity is more just sitting back and watching and wondering. I wonder what that's about for her. I wonder what's going on with him. I wonder what she needs me to know. I wonder what he would want from me right now. It's so important to listen then more than you talk. Curiosity isn't about talking and prying. Curiosity is about listening and trying to understand. We can't get to know them if we're lecturing all the time. Technology in the world that they live in is not the same as ours was. And honestly, it's not even the same as ours is now. They know no other life than one that's filled with access to technology and the internet and social media. And I am all about waiting as long as possible to introduce these into your children's lives. But it's an inevitability in our world today that they will have it. We definitely need to guide them through it, but we can't assume that we understand um, what it's actually like for them or by lecturing about how we didn't need it when we were their age. What's far more important is to connect with them through conversations about technology. This works far better than rules and consequences. Share your own concerns with the issue while you're hearing what their desires are. So for example, if your, I don't know, 13 year old wants Snapchat, it's really important to sit down and calmly talk about your points of views, each other's points of views. You might even be surprised that your child completely understands and agrees with some of your concerns. And you might be able to hear why he thinks that it's a fun way to connect with his peers. You're probably gonna have a far more productive conversation when you take the time to have a connecting conversation about it rather than simply refusing it. And then he goes and sneaks it later on. I wanna revisit, I wanna come back to this and I know I'm kind of running out of time so I'm gonna rush this just a little bit but I wanna come back one more time to the pain um, that comes from having your teenager pull away from you. This can cut deeper than so many other things. I read an article one time that called it the long breakup and it truly feels like that sometimes like they're just breaking up with you and pulling away except they aren't breaking up with us. They're asking to be allowed to go out into that room, into that world to explore, and we need to sit back and let them. We need to respect this desire to be independent while creating that safe harbor for them to come back to. It is painful to be dismissed and ignored and disrespected, but withdrawing our own attachment and in, uh, energy to protect ourselves only feels like that rejection. Um, one of the most 
important things to remember for a parent is to understand yourself and understand your own attachment history. Dan Siegel talks about this idea that how attached your child will be to you is determined by how you have dealt or addressed with your own attachment history. Whether you were able to have people who were there for you in your life that you could turn to. Because if you haven't dealt with that, if that wasn't there for you, you will come into a relationship partially shut down and a child will have a harder time connecting to you. And that's bound to cause problems. And then as they can't connect to you, that's going to lead to them having issues with connection in their future relationships. So dealing with your own past attachment issues is incredibly important so you can come into the relationship open so your child can fully connect with you and they will go on and have healthier relationships that way too. Really notice and pay attention to what your vulnerabilities are. If you feel hurt or you feel scared about what's gonna happen to them or you feel helpless because you don't know what to do and then you cover that up with anger, that will affect your child far more than if you lead with love. So your feelings might be there, but that's on you to take care of that as you feel hurt in that relationship sometimes. You need to still be leading and interacting with them from a place of love. Um, the book Raising a Secure Child by Hoffman, Cooper, and Powell have the whole last part of their book about a parent looking at themselves and how their own stuff plays into some of this. And I would definitely recommend that. I am going to end by reading something that I have turned to time and time and time again when it got really, really difficult with my teenagers. And um, it is a letter that was written by Gretchen Schmelzer. And it's the letter that your teenager wishes that they could write to you. So anytime it gets hard, if you can go find this, I would look this up and go read this, but I wanna share this. Dear parent, this is the letter I wish I could write. This fight we are in right now, I need it. I need this fight. I can't tell you this because I don't have the language for it and it wouldn't make sense anyway, but I need this fight badly. I need to hate you right now and I need you to survive it. I need you to survive my hating you and you hating me. I need this fight even though I hate it too. It doesn't matter what this fight is even about, curfew, homework, laundry, my messy room, going out, staying in, leaving, not leaving, boyfriend, girlfriend, no friends, bad friends. It doesn't matter. I need to fight you on it and I need you to fight me back. I desperately need you to hold on to the other end of the rope, to hang on tightly while I thrash on the other end, while I find the handholds and footholds in this new world I feel like I am in. I used to know who I was, who you were, who we were, but right now I don't. Right now I'm looking for my edges and I can sometimes only find them when I'm pulling on you, when I push everything I used to know to its edge. Then I feel like I exist and for a minute I can breathe. I know you long for the sweeter kid that I was. I know this because I long for that kid too. And some of that longing is what is so painful for me right now. I need this fight. And I need to see that no matter how bad or big my feelings are, they won't destroy you or me. I need you to love me even at my worst, even when it looks like I don't love you. I need you to love yourself for me and for the both of us right now. I know it sucks to be disliked and labeled the bad guy. I feel the same way on the inside, but I need you to tolerate it and get other grown-ups to help you because I can't right now. If you want to get all of your grown-up friends together and have a surviving your teenager support group rage fest, that's fine with me. Or talk about me behind my back. I don't care. Just don't give up on me. Don't give up on this fight. I need it. This is the fight that will teach me that my shadow is not bigger than my light. This is the fight that will teach me that bad feelings don't mean the end of a relationship. This is the fight that will teach me how to listen to myself, even when it might disappoint others. And this particular fight will end like any storm, it will blow over and I will forget and you will forget and then it will come back. And I will need you to hang on to that rope again. I will need this over and over for years. I know there's nothing inherently satisfying in this job for you. I know I will likely never thank you for it or even acknowledge your side of it. In fact, I will probably criticize you for all this hard work. It will seem like nothing you do will be enough. And yet I am relying entirely on your ability to stay in this fight, no matter how much I argue, no matter how much I sulk, no matter how silent I get. Please hang on to the other end of the rope and know that you are doing the most important job that anyone could ever possibly be doing for me right now. Love your teenager. So my very last thought is what I said in the beginning. I want you to go home and I want you to just get to know your kids. 
go and maybe say that you attended this talk today and you wanna hear from them what they need when it comes to connection, what helps and what doesn't. You might be surprised by what they have to share with you. Thank you. All right, Amy, thank you so much. I know that I learned so much. I feel like you gave a perfect balance of tips um, for how our kids are thinking and how they're feeling. And then on the flip side, how to balance that with our own personal emotions. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful. I did have quite a few questions come in. So um, we only have about four minutes left. Sorry about so, that. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. I um, would love to first just let everyone know that a lot of you have been asking for her resources and we will post this video to our website and we can have a list of resources, including that awesome uh, home story that you just read. People have been asking for that. So I, um, I'm going to read a couple of the questions here. So what do you do when your preteen seems too attached to you in some situations? My daughter who is 12, when we're in new situations and there are new peers, she would rather stay by me rather than mingling with other, other children. Um, okay, honestly, my first thought on that is I wouldn't be overly concerned about it. Um, it honestly, I think is something that will naturally start to change as she gets older. Some of that can be personality. Some of that can be just being more introverted um, and not feeling that comfortable. And so while I would encourage it, I wouldn't push it. I would just let her soak that up with you right now. It honestly is not a, a bad thing. Um, I'd probably need more specifics on some of that, but I wouldn't be overly concerned about it at this point. Okay, awesome. What about, this is pretty common too, where and how can we find, if parents are feeling like they loved your information, but they need some additional help, where can they find a therapist in their community? And remember, most people are from Montana, but not everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I know here in Billings right now, it's hard to find a therapist. It's, it's tough to get in to see somebody, but I don't want that. So I, I say that just because I don't want anyone to become um, discouraged by that. If they reach out, you may have to wait on someone's waiting list for a while. The place I would start first is asking friends. I think um, if you have a friend or someone that you know that had a good experience with a counselor, that is where I would start. It's easier than just picking a name off of the internet. So I would absolutely start there. Um, a, a site that has some therapists that, that you probably could find a good list would be Psychology Today. You could go online and look there. As you start to find websites, what I would really recommend is read the bios that therapists put online to see what their approaches are and what their experiences are. And that might give you a really good idea of who would be a good fit for you. For sure, thank you so much. Um, okay, I love this question. My husband and I have a very different approach to parenting. I love everything you shared, but I know that he wouldn't. So what should I do? Uh, that probably sounds like some marriage counseling. No, <laughs> that's honestly probably a marriage issue. What I would say is as long as you are working on having that healthy connection with your child, they're having it somewhere, which is really important. I would recommend starting out by just being curious instead of arguing with your husband or trying to convince him that you're right and he's wrong and he should do it this way. Be curious about why. It's honestly some of his own stuff and probably going back to some of his own background and the more curious you are about that, the less he's going to feel pressured to do it different and may honestly be more open to hearing how to do it in a different way. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask one last question here because we are slowing or running out of time a little bit. Um, I cannot stand my teenager's friends. <laughs> they are definitely not a good influence on him. Is there anything I can do at this point? I would not um, go to the extreme of refusing to let your child 
be around those peers, I would honestly have more of those conversations about what's the attraction to them. Um, talk about what your concerns are, just like I had talked about with this, the technology piece of it, sit down and have a conversation and ask them, do you see what my concerns are? Because chances are they probably do if you're willing to sit and hear why it's important to them to have them as friends. They're probably gonna hear your piece of it too. And to not forget the piece of make sure you're filling them up with connection with you first so that that's secondary to their relationship with you. I love that, Amy. That was one of, I wrote a whole page of notes, but that was one of the things I wrote down is fill your kid up with that connection. That was, that was amazing to me. And I also loved when you talked about the uh, sacredness of constancy. And I feel like that's something that all of us can do. We can yes. always be there for our kids in just small ways, whether we're working full time and barely see them or we're home with them all the time. That's something we can do is be yes. consistent. Yes. Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay. Well, that's all the time that we have today with Amy. Is there any last um, thing that you would like to share with us, Amy? And then I will let you know what's going on next week with our conference. No, I would just say kind of what I said at the end, always lead with love and go home and get to know your own teenagers. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. I think you can all agree that we are really lucky to be able to have heard from Amy today. She is just a wealth of knowledge. Um, I want to invite you all to join us next week. It'll be Tuesday, April 12th at noon, and we'll be talking about harmful trends among Montana youth with Stacy Zinn, who is the resident agent in charge at the Montana Drug Enforcement Administration, and also Agent Chris McClure, the Montana Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force Commander. Feel free to invite a friend next week and you can send them to mediasafety.org to sign up. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Amy, and we'll see you next time.